Thank you for downloading this episode of Case Notes. Case Notes was recorded at the Royal College of Physicians of Edinburgh as part of the Edinburgh History of Medicine seminar series. You can get news of our latest events if you follow us on Twitter at RCP Heritage. We hope you enjoy the talk. Thank you all for coming. It's a pleasure to be able to present my research to this audience. Towards the end of the 19th century, the Scottish system of corpse procurement was the envy of England's medical schools. For decades, it had worked discreetly and efficiently, a few minor scandals notwithstanding. But in 1891, a furor began in the Glasgow City Poorhouse, culminating in a court case after that institution's van driver was charged with having contravened the British Anatomy Act of 1832. Exposures made during John Daniel's trial threatened to bring to a halt the distinctive Scottish way of obtaining corpses for students to dissect. In this evening's talk, I'll start with these revelations, then examine how this system had arisen and for so long been maintained through creative alliances forged between anatomists, local authorities and Scotland's inspectors of anatomy. So to begin in 1891. In September of that year, people throughout Scotland and further afield read startling newspaper reports that human bodies were being turned into profitable objects by an entrepreneurial van driver, John Daniel, who worked for the Glasgow City Poorhouse. Daniel had been arrested for illegally obtaining and disposing of corpses and fraudulently creating the death certificates that were required under the Anatomy Act. It was his job to cart the corpses of people who died in the poorhouse to the Site Hill Cemetery for burial, and occasionally to instead take the bodies of people who died without relatives close by to the Glasgow Receiving House or Funeratory, from where they would be sent to the University of Glasgow's Medical School. That was legal under the Anatomy Act, for it authorised poorhouse officials to send unclaimed corpses to be dissected, so long as no relative objected and, crucially, so long as the body was accompanied by a certificate that gave the cause of the person's death and was signed by a medical man. This was to ensure that the deceased person had not been murdered by men like Burke and Hare. As the Scotsman newspaper explained to its readers, the certificate was a kind of title deed to the body it accompanied. But John Daniel had not been distinguishing between claimed and unclaimed corpses. Instead of the mere three bodies he should have disposed of to the receiving house, in 1891 alone he had taken 121 corpses there, those of nearly every man, woman and child who had died in the poorhouse, together with certificates he had forged. Superintendent Kennedy at the receiving house opened these coffins, inspected the bodies they contained and selected which were most suitable for dissection. For each of these he gave Daniel a gratuity of five shillings. In 1891 these sums earned the van man more than his annual poorhouse salary. And further disturbing revelations followed. The Anatomy Act's burial clause had also been contravened. It specified that after being dissected, each body was to be placed in a decent coffin or shell and buried in consecrated ground. But the dissected remains that arrived at the gates of the Site Hill Cemetery came in boxes rather than coffins and comprised bits and pieces of different bodies, all muddled together and none of which were identified. This meant that cemetery records were also being fraudulently constructed and up to seven of these grisly boxes were then shoveled into each anonymous lair. Until these revelations, most people had thought that the Glasgow Receiving House was no more than a city morgue, a place to which the bodies of destitute and poor people were taken prior to their burial on the grounds of convenience and hygiene. But the court case showed its actual purpose, which was to procure subjects for dissection for the city's anatomists. Like the funeratories in other Scottish towns, this one had been established during the 1830s to obscure the process through which those subjects were obtained and city authorities were willing participants in the deception. The receiving house was managed by an alliance of anatomy teachers, 
and those local authorities, the Lord Provost, the city's magistrates. The city chamberlain processed the dues anatomists paid him for the building's upkeep, including Superintendent Kennedy's salary and the gratuities he doled out to men like Daniel for the delicate duty they performed. And as Daniel's defence counsel argued, this way of doing things had been common practice for nearly half a century. When Daniel was convicted of having contravened the Anatomy Act, the trial judge stated that he had single-handedly, quote, been the means of breaking down practically the whole of the safeguards which the Anatomy Act provided against the abuse of its provisions, unquote. And newspapers reporting the case referred readers back to Burke and Hare. Those murders still served as a reminder of how far men might go in anatomy's cause. The Glasgow Herald warned that if the funerary system was overturned, serial killers like these two might return. Well, as everyone in this room knows, the murders committed in 1828 by William Burke and William Hare in Edinburgh, together with the deeds of grave robbers, have become anatomy's enduring reference points. But I think that their now mythic status does a disservice to history. It so captures our attention that we lose sight of how most corpses were obtained for medical science during the 19th century. Very few actually arrived on Scottish and English dissecting tables as a result of murder, while tens of thousands were obtained through the mundane and everyday practices that arose under the Anatomy Act, which gave officials in charge of institutions lawful possession of corpses, enabling them to dispose of these to medical schools rather than the grave. This is the history I've explored in a book published last year titled Possessing the Dead, The Artful Science of Anatomy. Though the trial judge in the Daniel case stated that this van driver had single-handedly been the means of negating the Anatomy Act safeguards, that was not the case at all. Daniel was but a small cog in a very large and efficient wheel. So how had this unique Scottish system of corpse procurement arisen? That larger history was captured at the time on paper and then archived. Each transaction in the cause of medical science is revealed in anatomy inspectors' letter books, in medical schools' body registers, in hospital and parish records, in newspaper accounts of scandalous cases, in court records, and in the proceedings of government inquiries. In this wide-ranging archive, each artful act of possession is illuminated and body disposals were captured too in neat ledger books, such as that kept by the Scottish Inspector of Anatomy, Dr Andrew Wood, which lists disposable bodies on one side and bodies not required on the other, as if corpses had become commodities like any other thing. Between 1834 and 1845, 1,550 bodies are accounted for on pages like these and all but 101 of them were dissected. But first, a little scene setting. Burke and Hare had profited from their murders because until 1832, subjects for dissection were difficult to come by. Scottish anatomists obtained them where they could, dealing with body snatchers, importing them from Ireland and sometimes France, bringing them in as contraband that was landed in boxes at night on deserted parts of the coastline. And those men who were lucky enough to hold hospital appointments made use of the bodies of the patients who died there. The only legal supply of corpses arrived in dissecting rooms from the gallows, when murderers hanged and, as a secondary punishment, their bodies were dissected under the 18th Century Murder Act. This is, of course, what happened to William Burke after his execution. Three years after that, anatomy murders were also discovered in London, where this woman, Elizabeth Ross, was executed in 1832. <clears throat> this is a, a sketch that was made of her just before the, the punitive dissection began at the Royal College of Surgeons in London. Unlike others, Ross was more a suspected than a convicted Burkite. She had been found guilty of murdering an elderly woman for a reason that could not be established. Therefore, in one newspaper's words, the only motive that could be guessed at was that she had done it for profit by selling the body to a medical school. 
That's the trouble with Birking. By 1832, people had begun to fear that such murderers were operating everywhere, all evidence of their crimes lost when their victim's body was dissected. To make such crimes less profitable and thus deter them, a large and cheap source of corpses for medical schools would have to be identified and legalised. The question was whose bodies should these be? That was the subject of a lengthy debate, for it was clear that specific groups would need to be conscripted as subjects, given that very few people donated their bodies to medical schools at this time. The dead houses of institutions seemed to many commentators to be the ideal places from which corpses should be taken. And the anatomy debates therefore shone a light on broader deliberations taking place at the time in industrialising Britain. These insistently differentiated between the deserving and the undeserving poor. The words used by George Guthrie, Professor of Anatomy and Surgery, illustrate the point. He wrote that those who had fallen into, quote, a virtuous and honourable poverty, unquote, through no fault of their own, should not be amongst the poor who were dissected. Instead, shiftless people should join criminals on the dissecting table to become what were commonly called the surgeon's things. Another surgeon suggested that the best source of bodies would be, quote, the rogues, vagrants and prostitutes who fill our jails, hospitals and workhouses, unquote. These people, he argued, had lived and died encumbrances on the public and using their bodies would not, quote, wound the feelings of anyone of character worth estimating. In such thinking, dissection clearly remained punishment, though now for poverty rather than murder. The belief that those whose lives had burdened society should posthumously repay that debt was one of the strongest themes in the British anatomy debates. Finally, nearly everyone discussing this matter in the early 19th century held that using the bodies of people without relatives to claim them for burial was a morally neutral choice. This argument was persuasive, for it appeared to be compassionate. If there were no relatives to grieve, then no one's feelings would be injured by a body being mutilated. But some who took part in the debate were concerned that focusing exclusively on relatives' feelings failed to take into account people's own preferences about the post-mortem destination of their remains. Indeed, it assumed, quote, that the dying and friendless poor themselves feel nothing, unquote. The Anatomy Act that passed through Parliament in 1832 was designed to prevent, quote, the, di the diverse great and grievous crimes lately murder, unquote, that had been committed to obtain and sell bodies to medical schools by instead making a lawful supply of corpses available to them. Given how unpopular dissection was, Henry Warburton, who drafted the Act, had created a, a deceptive piece of legislation. The statute was titled A Bill for Regulating Schools of Anatomy, though it did no such thing. The word dissection did not appear in it. Instead, the term anatomical examination was used. To the lay person, such an examination may not involve cutting at all. No mention was made of the sources from which bodies would be obtained. Instead, a clause created a group of unspecified officials who would henceforth be considered to be in lawful possession of bodies for the purpose of sending them to a medical school rather than burying them. And they could do that within 48 hours of the person's death. From this time, men in positions of authority in workhouses and poorhouses, hospitals, lunatic asylums and jails were authorised to send corpses to be dissected. Two caveats applied. Should people know of the Act's existence, they could leave a formal witnessed protest against that post-mortem fate and relatives could object by claiming a corpse within 48 hours for burial. The Act's boosters asserted that this meant that only unclaimed bodies would be sent to schools. However, the Act did not require officials to notify poorhouse residents and hospital patients or their relatives of this law's existence, nor of their ability to dissent to a dissection. This undercut what appeared to be consideration for relatives' views. 
the larger good of medical education required the greatest possible number of bodies to be made available to students. As the Duke of Sussex articulated this in the House of Lords, quote, while no man can more earnestly desire than I do that the delicacy of family feeling should not be outraged, if some arrangements be not speedily made, you will drive the study of anatomy altogether from this country." Unquote. And the letter books kept by the inspectors of anatomy appointed under the Anatomy Act reveal how difficult it proved to be for people to extricate themselves and their relatives from becoming subjects for dissection for the rest of the century. The right to dissent from that post-mortem use of remains was routinely subverted and the inspectors were complicit in this. When the Act passed, two inspectors were appointed, Dr James Somerville for England and Wales and Dr David Craigie for Scotland. The English inspector worked closer to the Home Office in London, of which the inspectorate was a part, and he developed the system of certification that should have enabled the inspectors to track each corpse from the place in which the person had died, through the medical school, to which it was consigned, and ultimately to its grave. On the left here we have a notice of disposal which would be signed by a poorhouse master and sent to the inspector, and on the right a burial certificate to prove that the remains had ultimately been buried, or supposedly. David Craigie, the Scottish inspector, was well qualified for this role. He had graduated from the University of Edinburgh, then taught for a short time in an extramural school in Surgeon Square. By 1832, he was an elected physician at the Royal Infirmary, a fellow of Scotland's Royal College of Surgeons, and he edited the Edinburgh Medical and Surgical Journal. Initially, Craigie, like Somerville in London, reported directly to the Secretary of State. But problems soon arose in Edinburgh, and to resolve these, he was directed to work closely with local authorities. It was difficult to imagine how overnight the schools would switch from purchasing corpses from resurrectionists or importing them to the new system of persuading poorhouse governors to hand over the corpses of the paupers who died in their institutions. For the law did not compel these men to do that and they knew that should they be found out, they would be vilified. At the opening of the winter dissecting season in 1832, few bodies were available from these new sources, so Scotland's teachers turned to their customary ways of obtaining supplies. Graves were robbed, and James Somerville detected corpses travelling around the English and Irish countryside in coaches on their way to Scotland. He feared that these would be discovered by unsuspecting paying passengers and a scandal result. Somerville demanded that Inspector Craigie set a watch over Edinburgh's dissecting rooms to find out who had solicited these corpses. He suspected it was Robert Knox. But Craigie refused to station police officers at the anatomist's doors, knowing the scandal that would surely result. He therefore wrote directly to the Home Office in London, who instructed him to ignore Somerville given how easily, quote, the feeling which exists in Edinburgh with respect to schools of anatomy might be aroused, unquote. Instead, the Home Office advised Craigie to communicate directly with Edinburgh's Lord Advocate and the Solicitor General. The Home Office wanted the Scottish Inspector to be guided by local advice when he discovered breaches of the Anatomy Act, for he knew how interested they were in deterring any scandal that might arise so soon after the Burke and Hare murders. As for the reluctance of Scotland's poorhouses to be seen supplying corpses to the schools, Craigie sought advice from James Somerville in London. He suggested that Craigie instruct undertakers to remove corpses from the poorhouses, taking them to their own premises <coughs> rather than taking them directly to a school. In that way, it would appear that these bodies were being taken away to be buried. Then, after dark, the corpses could be taken to the schools without attracting any publicity. Edinburgh's extramural schools were experiencing severe shortages of material. But at the University of Edinburgh, Professor Alexander Munro Tertius and his assistant William Mackenzie were being well supplied, for they had exclusive access to the Royal Infirmary's unclaimed dead patients. 
William Mackenzie kept a series of body registers that Matthew Kaufman has also examined for this period. These reveal the sources of the university's subjects for dissection and thus illuminate how these people's bodies had come in death to be designated unclaimed and so available for this purpose. Over the first two years after 1832, 45 corpses arrived in the university's practical rooms, all but four of them adults. More than half of these people had died in the infirmary. The others had died in institutions that housed Edinburgh's poor, mainly the House of Refuge, but also the City Charity Workhouse. One of the columns in the body register book is headed, Last Place of Abode. For most of these people, that column has been left blank. Sometimes even the dead person's name was unknown in the place in which they had died. This designation is what made their corpses available for dissection. And it's not surprising, for many people were out of place in Edinburgh at this time, which was one of massive population movements. When strangers came to Edinburgh and could not find work, they sought assistance from the town's institutions. But under the Scottish Poor Law, such people had no automatic right to support, and vagrancy was on the rise. When these people died, without relatives close by to object, their corpses were available to be dissected. In contrast to the university's <coughs> steady supply of bodies, Edinburgh's extramural schools were in great difficulty. They therefore formed themselves into an association of teachers and established a new system of buying bodies and distributing them amongst themselves. During the winter dissecting season of 1834 to 5, association men paid five pounds for an entire adult corpse and only three pounds if it had been opened for a post-mortem examination. A child's corpse could be bought for two pounds, half that if opened, and infants came free of charge. The City Charity Workhouse was their most consistent source of supply. This workhouse's treasurer, John Waugh, provided extraordinary assistance to Edinburgh's Association of Teachers, who quickly bound him into the weft and weave of their activities. In addition to supplying bodies from the workhouse and overseeing their distribution between the various schools, Waugh met with town authorities and with other parish officials on the association's behalf to try to open up new sources of supply. For his services, the association paid war with gifts and money, first seven and sixpence per corpse, and later annual amounts of 50 to 70 pounds. He was given a new title, Secretary of the Anatomical Schools, and he held this position in conjunction with his well-paid role as treasurer of the city charity workhouse. Most importantly, war was pivotal to the concept of a funeratory. He offered the Association of Teachers the use of the workhouse mortuary, which was next door to his office for this purpose. It was only meant as a depository for the bodies of people who died in his own institution. But War suggested that parochial authorities of the West Church, Canongate and Leith should transport the corpses of people who died there to the workhouse mortuary he oversaw and from which he distributed bodies to the schools. But then, in 1836, to the association men's dismay, this useful man, John War, emigrated to New South Wales. He had recently edited a book of his son's letters from there, which contained biling tales of a place so unlike Scotland that a man could sleep out under the stars for most of the year. In the preface, John War wrote of Scotland being populated beyond its natural resources of a country in which men like him in the middle ranks of society could not get ahead even by living in the most economical manner and by undertaking unremitting labour. So he left for New South Wales. The association, having lost this valuable man's services, wrote to London to suggest that a system of what they now called funeratories <coughs> should be established in Scotland based on the city charity workhouse model. A funeratory, they said, was needed in each parish or district, and to them every corpse to be buried at public expense, whether or not relatives existed, should be conveyed. Inspector Somerville advocated on the teacher's behalf with the Secretary of State 
on the grounds that Edinburgh schools faced special problems for people there felt an extreme repugnance to anatomy. This meant that removing bodies to be dissected was an activity, quote, attended with great odium and considerable danger, unquote. So unusual measures were required. The Home Office was convinced. It devoted a large sum, 400 pounds, to extend the funeratory system in Scotland. Subterfuge lay at the core of this novel scheme. Funeratories were established for one purpose, to quietly obtain as many corpses as possible for anatomy schools. But this purpose was artfully obscured by making a funeratory appear to be no more than a city dead house, to which all bodies, at least those of people who did not die in their own homes, were taken before they were buried. I searched everywhere for an image of one of the funeratories and couldn't find one, so this is the current Glasgow City Morgue, obviously built in the 19th century, just to set the scene. The funeratory plan was ingenious. If relatives existed and learned of the death, they were sent to the funeratory to organise and pay for the burial. If they did not arrive there within 48 hours, that is, if they did not live locally, the funeratory superintendent, whose wages were paid by the Association of Teachers, completed the anatomy inspector's paperwork and sent the body to a medical school. There was no longer any need to remove these corpses <coughs> under cover of darkness, for bodies destined for burial provided what one funeratory superintendent called a cover for the larger scheme. Despite a few hiccups over the years, this deceptive system became so routine that it would be referred to during the 1891 Glasgow scandal as a machine, which is what it was, a machine for turning human remains into objects to dissect. Everyone's interests were served. The Home Office, its anatomy inspector and Scotland's civic authorities were happy, for the schools were now being supplied with corpses in ways that drew no attention to that fact and so did not result in scandals. The men in charge of Scotland's nip-farthing institutions for the poor were pleased, for the schools paid the cost of carting all corpses to the funeratory, as well as the costs of burying every corpse that was unclaimed from them, whether or not it was sent to be dissected. That was the price the teachers were willing to pay for their deceit. No odium now attached to those poor houses for complying with the Act, for they did not appear to be doing so. And the teachers were happy because they acquired increased numbers of corpses from institutions that had previously been reluctant to send them any. Upon receiving that £400 to extend this system, James Somerville asked the Association of Teachers for their views on how the funeratories should be managed. They informed him that it would be better in the eyes of the public if the teachers did not appear to have any interest in them. In 1842, Dr Andrew Wood replaced Somerville as the Scottish Anatomy Inspector, and he served in this role for almost 40 years, during which the inspectorate became thoroughly enmeshed with the school's interests, in a way that had not been envisaged during the passage of the Anatomy Act. I won't discuss that this afternoon, as I deal with it in my book. The main point is that throughout Wood's tenure, he worked hard to maintain the fiction that Scotland's medical schools had nothing to do with the country's funeratories. And where necessary, this meant that he engaged in lies and deceptions. Wood was replaced in 1881 by Dr James Russell, under whom the Scottish system of corpse procurement reached its highest point. Russell had graduated in medicine at the University of Edinburgh in 1868, having learned his anatomy from Professor William Turner, whose demonstrator and assistant he was until 1876. But Russell's main interests lay in public health and local government. He held a Bachelor of Science in Public Health and from 1880 was a member of the Edinburgh Town Council. During his tenure as anatomy inspector, Russell became a Bailey in 1885, Lord Provost in 1891, and he was knighted in 1894. According to an article published at the time of his knighthood, Russell was, quote, a man of absolute honesty of purpose and of sterling integrity, unquote. But as Scotland's anatomy inspector, Russell was enthralled to Sir William Turner, 
to such a degree as to lay this assessment open to question. <clears throat> Together, Russell and Turner worked to open up new sources of corpse supply, notable among them Scotland's lunatic asylums. This was a controversial undertaking. At least on paper, the anatomy statute enabled poorhouse residents and general hospital patients to make a rational choice, should they know about the act, about whether or not they wished to be dissected when they died. But people were confined in lunatic asylums because they were deemed to be incapable of making rational decisions. As Reverend John Burden wrote to the medical superintendent of one lunatic asylum, quote, Insanity is a misfortune, not a crime, and though it may be fair enough to dissect the bodies of those who've died in public hospitals to which they've sought access voluntarily, surely in asylums where the insane poor are detained without any consent of their own or their friends, the practice ought not to be permitted." Unquote. Others shared this concern, and in Scotland, Inspector Russell and Professor Turner met with opposition at some asylums. The medical superintendent at Rosewell Asylum refused on the grounds that there was, quote, such a feeling of repugnance in the public mind to any method of disposal of bodies other than the ordinary burial that I hesitate to do anything that might lay my actions open to misconstruction or give rise to any vulgar superstitions, unquote. But with other asylums, Russell and Turner had more success. This is all that's left of this one. Dr James Rutherford, physician superintendent of the Barony Parochial Asylum for the Insane at Lindsay, agreed to send corpses, though he soon had cause to complain. Russell's clerk, who was also a funeratory employee, arrived at this asylum to collect a body at an improper hour and in a conveyance that was far from decent looking and this threatened to expose something Rutherford would rather keep secret, for this asylum's Board of Governors was unaware of the deal he'd struck with Russell and Turner. A second initiative Russell introduced was to make local Scottish laws amenable to increasing body supplies to medical schools, to such a degree that by the end of the century in Scotland, the Anatomy Act would be construed as compelling rather than enabling poorhouse masters, lunatic asylum superintendents and others to send corpses to be dissected. In accomplishing this, Russell's strong connections with local government stood the anatomists in good stead. First, he met with the Lord Advocate to request modification of the poor law bills. As matters stood under them, sanitary officials were responsible for burying poverty-stricken people who died in their homes rather than inside institutions. Russell wished to obtain such bodies for the anatomy schools, and in this he succeeded until a newspaper exposed that sanitary officials were sending bodies to funeraries rather than burying them. But he had more success during the 1880s, when new police and health bills were being developed in both Glasgow and Edinburgh. Russell organised meetings between William Turner and the Lord Advocate regarding these. The Lord Advocate subsequently asked Russell to draft clauses for inclusion in the new legislation. This Russell did, inserting one that stated, quote, all persons deceased without known relatives shall be removed, disinfected and buried according to the provisions of the Anatomy Act, unquote. And Russell wrote to John Clayland at the University of Glasgow, asking him and his Baileys to, quote, contrive to influence your members of parliament to make them give this clause a totally silent reception." Unquote. Clayland agreed with Russell that no one must imagine that the Burg Police and Health Scotland Bill went near anatomical matters. From the time these acts passed in 1890 and 1891, Anatomy Inspector Russell used them to reinterpret the 1832 Anatomy Act in a way favourable to the medical schools. A decade later, he could boast that, quote, in both Edinburgh and Glasgow, the Anatomy Act is virtually made compulsory now by clauses in these local acts, unquote. This is how matters stood in 1891 when the Glasgow Receiving House scandal occurred. <clears throat> 
The arrest of Daniels, the van driver, caused consternation at the University of Glasgow's medical school. The dissecting season would soon begin, and the parochial board had resolved to send no more bodies from its poorhouse to the funeratory for disposition to the school. Professor John Clayland demanded that Inspector Russell, who was now Lord Provost of Edinburgh, resolve the problem by finding a way to bypass the ban by once again using the Scottish Sanitary Act. This Russell did, instructing the Sanitary Board's inspector to read the new Glasgow Police Act and see that he must send bodies to the schools. Meanwhile, Clayland worked behind the scenes to overturn the parochial board's decision regarding Glasgow poorhouse bodies. He sought out board members who were likely to be sympathetic to his cause, notably Dr Le Prague. Once again, the police and Burg Acts were invoked. Le Prague deceived board members by informing them that they were actually violating the Anatomy Act by denying corpses to the school which was not the case at all. Several board members now took the initiative. They asked poorhouse residents how they would like their bodies to be disposed of when they died. All said that they would rather die in the highways and byways than in the poorhouse if their bodies were to be dissected. To this, Dr Le Prague responded that if they died in the street, they'd be dissected in any event, being considered unclaimed. His arguments won the day and a majority of board members again authorised the poorhouse to send bodies to be dissected. But this scandal was spreading and other parochial boards met throughout Scotland to discuss it. Some learned for the first time that bodies from their own poorhouses were being sent to medical schools. They called upon Inspector Russell to attend their meetings and explain the legality of the funeratory system, which did not seem legal to them. Russell responded that the matter was not sufficiently important for him to obtain legal opinion. The South Leith Parochial Board was amazed that its poor house had been part of the funeratory <coughs> machine for 50 years, though no board member knew anything of it. They had believed that the bodies of people who died in the poor house lay in the dead house, which this arrow points to, from which they were buried but instead poor house officials were sending these to the funeratory. And in return, those officials received eight shillings per corpse, more than John Daniel had received. That should have concerned the anatomy inspector. But only the board's resolution to remove its poor house from the machine worried Russell. They did so on the grounds that the funeratory system took, quote, mean and contemptible advantage of dying people, unquote. Worse, from Russell's perspective, board members expressed their outrage in language that anatomy inspectors like him had long sought to avoid and which was reported in newspapers. They talked of bodies being beheaded and quartered, of flesh being stripped from bones. They expressed their doubt that any remains were ultimately buried at all. And they contrasted the treatment of poor people's bodies with the recent grand funeral of the Duke of Clarence, who had died of influenza aged 28. South Leith parochial board members asked why Clarence had not been dissected. These comments and sharp questions were only brought to a halt when Professor William Turner paid this board a visit and related to them the history of Scottish difficulties in obtaining bodies for medical students to dissect. It had, he pointedly reminded the board, resulted in murders being committed. After that, a majority of the board agreed to continue to send bodies into the machine. If Burke and Hare had not actually existed, they surely would have needed to be invented, so useful as they still were to anatomists in 1891. Two decades later, English civil servants were trying to understand how matters could be so different in Scotland. <coughs> The Home Office was under pressure for, for subjects to dissect remain stubbornly difficult to source in England. Even the Times noticed how desperate matters were regarding what its reporter called this gruesome question. Civil servants were directed to examine Scottish arrangements. To their surprise, they learned that Inspector James Russell had made the Anatomy Act compulsory there due to his ability to quietly influence local laws.
and they discovered how successive Scottish inspectors had tightly woven themselves into the system of corpse procurement, working closely with teachers and local authorities through the medium of the funeraries. In contrast, England's inspectors had stuck to the spirit of the Anatomy Act, legislation which gave them no power to source or distribute bodies, but left this in the hands of the schools. As one English inspector articulated this, quote, it was no part of his role to visit and plead with the institutions that refused the teachers' demands. To do so would make the anatomy inspectors procurers of dead bodies, and that was never contemplated by the Anatomy Act, unquote. So in England, the control of subjects continued to lie with the masters and stewards of workhouses and other institutions, and they could choose to send them to be dissected or to bury them. Well, as tonight's talk has shown, in Scotland, novel solutions had been developed to overcome this situation. A distinctive pattern of corpse procurement was creatively forged here to get around what anatomists viewed as the shortcomings of the 1832 legislation. And from an historical perspective, this is a more significant aspect of the past than the grave robbing and the Burke and Hare murders which have become anatomy's best known reference points. For most of the 19th century and well into the 20th, bodies were stealthily acquired through alliances between anatomists, inspectors, local lawmakers, and the men who were in charge of poorhouses, hospitals, and lunatic asylums, all of which can be pleasurably uncovered in archival repositories. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for listening to our History of Medicine lecture series, Case Notes. This podcast has been brought to you by the Royal College of Physicians of Edinburgh. We're a charity, and if you enjoyed today's show, head over to rcpe.ac.uk heritage for more information and how to donate. Thank you. <laughs>